what a beautiful day in Cedar Rapids. I am so excited and happy to be back here. I really think of Iowa and especially all the communities that I visited as the place that got my campaign started and gave me gave me the chance, as only Iowa does, to talk with families about all the problems that keep you up at night. And boy, did I hear a lot about rising prescription drug costs and the costs of college and student debt and the epidemic, the quiet epidemic of addiction and mental health issues, the challenge of balancing family and work, all of those conversations in coffee shops and college campuses really put me on the path to understanding what it is your next president should do. And you invited me into your homes, your businesses, factory floors, so many places where people were working hard and thinking about the kind of future you wanted for yourselves and your families. And so now with just 11 days left, we've got work to do. I want to thank Cindy Garlock for introducing me. As she told you, she's a retired teacher. She's one of our neighborhood team leaders. She and everyone working across the state are going to make sure that we win Iowa. I also am pleased to be joined here with a number of women leaders who are especially committed to making sure we have the kind of future that we need. And before I get to them, let me say a word about the recent flooding here in Cedar Rapids. You escaped another historic flood, like the one you had eight years ago, thank heaven. But we know that homes and families were still affected. And we need to make sure you have the resources you need, not just to respond to this flood, but to prevent devastation from future flooding. The progress that you've made in rebuilding Cedar Rapids, especially right here in the Nubo District, proves what's possible when we work together to solve our challenges. You know, I really do believe we are stronger together, and that's why, as president, I'll do everything I can to make sure we do more to protect Cedar Rapids and eastern Iowa from flooding and natural disasters. How many times do you have to go through this until we all say, hey, let's get together and make the changes we need to make sure you don't get devastated again? Now, I am thrilled to be here with some amazing women, both behind me and in front and on all sides of me. I see some women wearing t-shirts and sweatshirts that say, nasty woman. I mean, really, you can't make this stuff up, but I want to, I want to say a word of support and recognition of Patty Judge, your former Lieutenant Governor candidate for U.S. Senate. Who sure would bring a lot of common sense and hard-won experience to Washington. And I also hope that you will send Monica Vernon to the Congress. Now, what I, what I just said about Cedar Rapids and Eastern Iowa, I need some uh, reinforcements. And Monica and Patty would be just that, making the case for why this part of Iowa, this part of our country, is so essential to the agricultural industry, to food production industry. We've got a lot that we need to be doing. And I am thrilled to be here with my friends, 
Elise Hogue, Cecile Richards, and Stephanie Shriok. They are fearless and tireless advocates for women, and they organize. They get up every day trying to figure out what we're going to do to make sure we protect and further the rights of women and families in our country. And they have a lot of experience standing up to bullies, which is why they're especially dear to me. And I know that we've got to keep our foot on the gas. Donald Trump says he can still win. And you know, he's right. Anything can happen in an election. And here's his campaign strategy. He hasn't made it a big secret. His strategy is to get women to stay home, get young people to stay home, get people of color to stay home. It's all part of his scorched earth campaign, the last refuge of a bankrupt candidate. And it goes against everything we stand for in America. Now, we're not going to let that happen, are we? And you know how we will do that? By voting, by showing up with the biggest turnout in history. More women voting, more young people voting, more people of color voting, more Americans of every kind voting for a good, positive, unified vision of the future. And I have to tell you, once again, Iowa, you can make the difference. If all of you vote, if you get your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers to vote, we will make history on November the 8th. And I have to say that we're seeing some really promising signs of this. Right now, more than 200 million Americans have registered to vote. That is the biggest number in history. And of that 200 million, more than 50 million are young people, which is fabulous. So people are turning out, and I want to give you something to vote for, not just against, because I want you to be part of helping us implement an agenda that's going to move our country forward. I started my career all those years ago fighting for kids and families. That's been the cause of my life. It will be the mission of my presidency. I will get up every single day in the White House saying, what am I going to do to help every single person and especially every child in this country have the chance to live up to his or her God-given potential? Now, I, I will admit to this, I am sometimes criticized for having too many policies. And, you know, it's probably true. I, I have a plan for just about everything. I even wrote a book with my wonderful running mate, Tim Kaine, called Stronger Together, which has all of our ideas in it. And the other day it struck me, because, you know, I do hear people making fun of me, like, oh, all the policies and the plans and everything. And I thought, well, you know, maybe this is a woman thing. We make lists, right? I love making lists, and then I love crossing things off. So I want you to imagine that together we're going to vote on November 8th for an agenda that will become a list that we will work on to implement, to improve your lives and make our country stronger and fairer and better in the future. Now, did any of you see the last debate? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I stood next to Donald Trump for four and a half hours during those three debates. I think that proves once and for all I have the stamina to be president and commander-in-chief. And, and I have to tell you, he was always saying something that I was finding, oh boy, unacceptable. 
And I kept reminding myself, people say, well, you know, how did you keep your composure? Well, I practiced that a lot. I had my team and the young man playing Trump for me just insult me up and down. It was exhausting. I spent hours being insulted by my team and my friends. And boy, did it prepare me to stand there with the insulter known as Donald Trump. And so I kept thinking to myself, those that wonderful line that Michelle Obama delivered in our convention when she gave her speech, when they go low, we go high. Now, Donald Trump has gone low, but in that last debate, he said something that was truly horrifying. He refused to say he would respect the results of this election. I know. It, 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 it has never been done before. Nobody. You can go back and look at debates and speeches. Nobody running for president, representing one of our two major parties, has ever said that. And I have to say, the first thing a president does on January 20th is to take an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. In our country, we have free and fair elections and a peaceful transfer of power. That is one of the great hallmarks of American democracy. And when you question the very institutions of our democracy, going back to the founding of our country, you are attacking democracy. Now, we have seen Donald Trump attack so many different kinds of Americans. He's attacked African Americans and Latinos and immigrants and Muslims and POWs and, of course, women and people with disabilities, right? But now his final target seems to be democracy itself. You know, I went to 112 countries as your Secretary of State, and in a lot of those countries, they are... They're nowhere near democracies. They're dictatorships, they're authoritarian regimes, or they pretend to be democracies, but, you know, one of the people on the ballot gets 99% of the vote. And I knew every time I went anywhere else in the world, how blessed I am to be an American. There's so many things to be grateful for and how we govern ourselves and how we conduct our elections is among them. So we cannot just blow off what he's saying because he still is saying it. He's standing up in front of large crowds and you can see how he's egging them on, talking about rigged elections talking about how we should just cancel the election and make him president? Right, yeah. Well, we've got to be vigilant about this. This is, this is not something to be made light of because there have been too many times in world history where somebody gets elected and then that's the last election that is held. So we have to not only stand up for whoever our candidates are, we have to stand up for the process of electing them because that's how we lead ourselves. That's how we make decisions together. Now, I really believe that people are responding to that. And look at what's already happened. More than 16 and a half million people have already voted. And here in Iowa, 370,000 people have cast their votes. One of those voters is Rulene Steininger in Des Moines, and she was born in 1913, before women had the right to vote. She's 103 now, and she's a pistol. She came to see me last time I was in Des Moines, which happened to be the first day of early voting. And she came to tell me she was on her way to cast her vote. 
She had her walker. She had some of her young family members there with her. But she was determined that she was going to vote and vote early. So don't let anybody tell you they're too busy to vote. If Ruleen can do it, anybody can get to the polls, get to the early voting places, get to the mailbox, cast your vote. I'm excited about what we're seeing across the country because I think people turn out because they want to be for a better future, a common vision, a dynamic America where everyone counts and everyone has a place. So let me just briefly talk about some of the issues that I think people care about because when you stop to think about it, every one of those issues is truly on the ballot. Now they may not be listed, it might be my name and my opponent's name, but they're on the ballot. Here's one example. Throughout this campaign, actually throughout his life, Donald Trump has demeaned and insulted women. Now, we all heard the tape of him on the bus bragging about what he did to women. And given his long track record of lewd and offensive comments about women, it was shocking but not surprising. And then one woman after another has come forward to say what he said on that tape is exactly what he did to me. Now, how did Donald Trump respond? Well, he started holding big rallies, broadcast on TV. And he said he couldn't possibly have done those things because the women speaking out weren't attractive enough for him to have assaulted. He said, one woman, and I quote him, would not be my first choice. Look at her. I don't think so. He even called the female journalist covering the story disgusting, which he's called other women as well. He's also on tape bragging to the radio personality, Howard Stern, that he would routinely barge into the dressing rooms of beauty pageant contestants while they were undressed to, quote, inspect the women. That was his word. He was inspecting them. I sort of get away with that, he said. And, and maybe the most alarming part of what he said is that he admitted he did it with teenage contestants. Can you imagine? This is a man who relishes making women feel terrible about themselves in every possible way. Someone who thinks belittling and objectifying women make him a bigger man. He goes after dignity and self-worth of women, and I don't think there's a woman anywhere who doesn't know what that feels like. So this is who Donald Trump is. This is how he speaks, this is how he thinks, this is what he does. Now it's time for all of us to stand up and say, this is not who we are. We are better than that. We are Americans. So I've got to say, it, it's no surprise that every policy he talks about reflect the same disrespect, even contempt, for women. So make no mistake, women's health and rights, our futures, the futures of our daughters and our granddaughters, are on the ballot. We were reminded of that in the last debate when he pledged to overturn Roe v. Wade and end safe and legal abortion. He promised to defund Planned Parenthood, to wipe away the health care services that millions of women get for cancer screenings and so many other necessary help. And I, I just have to say, we have come too far to let Donald Trump take us back, haven't we? And, you know, I fight for women's issues not just because I'm a woman. 
but because I believe these are American issues. Again, remember those 112 countries I visited, I saw in many of them the way women were treated, how they were marginalized and sidelined, how they were not guaranteed an education, health care, an opportunity to pursue their own dreams and ambitions. I think we have to continue to set the example that if you believe everyone in this country deserves an opportunity to go as far as their talent and hard work will take them, that includes both men and women, and every one of us should be committed to that goal. Well, you know, I started saying all this way back in the campaign months and months ago, and Donald Trump would say I was playing the woman card. Remember that? And you know what I say if standing up for women's health and women's rights is playing the woman card, then deal me in. But we also have to make the economy work for everyone, not just those at the top. Men and women, the young, the old, everybody should have an economic opportunity to go as far as they can. Because I believe when the middle class thrives, America thrives. And we're going to fight hard to make the biggest investment in new jobs since World War II. Investments in infrastructure, advanced manufacturing, technology, innovation, small businesses, which are the real heartbeat of any economy, where most of the new jobs will come from. And we're going to invest in clean, renewable energy to create millions of new jobs in that field. We are going to make America the clean energy superpower of the 21st century with your help. And I go around, I go around bragging about Iowa because you already get a third of your electricity from clean energy, mostly wind, right? So we know we can do this on a national basis. And we also have to make the economy fairer. That means raising the national minimum wage. So if you work full time, you're not mired in poverty. It means finally guaranteeing equal pay for women's work. And it means having affordable child care and paid family leave because families are under so much stress today. And I met so many so many young family members, moms and dads, as I traveled across Iowa. And I keep meeting people who are really under tremendous pressure. Tim Kaine and I were in Pittsburgh last week, and Tim was talking to a big group of folks, and one of the women was holding a three-year-old daughter. And Tim said, as we do, what a beautiful little girl. And the woman said, I came here to tell you and to tell Hillary Clinton that right after I had my baby, I got fired from my job because I had a tough pregnancy and a tough labor and delivery, and I couldn't come right back to work, so they fired me. I'll tell you, if we say we care about children and family values, don't you think we ought to have paid family leave and actually prove that we do? And you've heard me say before, we're going to have universal pre-kindergarten because we need to start our kids off with the best possible educational beginning. We're going to have good teachers and good schools in every zip code in Iowa and across America. And, you know, I'm very proud of the campaign that Senator Sanders and I ran. It was a campaign about issues and ideas, not insults, right? And when it finished, he and I got together, and we have a plan to make public colleges and universities tuition-free for families making less than $125,000 a year. That's the vast majority of families, but if you're over that number, we're going to make it debt-free. So you pay what you can afford, but you don't go into debt. And no matter, no matter where you go to college, 
We are going to make it easier and quicker for you to refinance, pay back, and end your student debt. I think it's time to support teachers and students, so vote to put a world-class education within reach for everyone. And we are also going to make sure that we have a tax system that is fair. And you know what that means? Nobody making less than $250,000 a year will have your taxes raised one bit. I have made that pledge. I'm going to carry through with that pledge. But we're going to tax millionaires and billionaires and corporations because they're not paying their fair share. And you can, you can hear it when Trump talks about what he wants to do. He says, he wants to cut trillions, that's trillions with a T, trillions of dollars in taxes from millionaires, billionaires, and corporations. Man, that is trickle-down economics on steroids. That is the worst idea. We need to build the economy from the middle out and the bottom up. That's what's going to get it growing and providing more jobs and opportunities. And it's especially ironic coming from a guy who didn't pay any federal income taxes, right? You know, back in the 90s, he lost a billion dollars. He says that makes him smart. Look, I, I just don't know how smart you have to be to lose a billion dollars in one year running casinos. But I I've never met somebody who lost money running casinos because with casinos, the house always wins, right? So he calls himself smart. His supporters call him a genius. Well, I guess you have to be a genius to lose a billion dollars in a year. But here's what's important. Every one of us, every one of us who's worked, gotten a paycheck, we've paid more in income tax to support our military, our vets, Pell Grants for students, health care, highways, education, agriculture, than Donald Trump. And I think that tells you everything you need to know about him. This is Donald Trump to a T. He is the poster boy for bad business behavior. His companies denied housing to African Americans because of their race. He made most of his products in other countries, not the United States. He bought Chinese steel instead of American steel to build his hotels. He stiffed small businesses. And I've met these people. I mean, my dad was a small businessman, and I know how hard he worked. And I've met people who had a contract with Donald Trump. They thought they'd died and gone to heaven. They were so excited. So they supplied pianos to his hotels. They installed marble or glass. They installed drapery fabrics. They worked hard, and then it came time to be paid, and he stiffed them. He wouldn't pay them. And honestly, it just, it just made me very happy that my father never had a contract from Donald Trump because when you work that hard, you deserve to be paid for the work and the services and the products you provide. So my friends, here's the bottom line. We all need to think about whatever issue is most important and visualize that on the ballot. And then compare, compare and contrast what I've done for the last 30 years with what he's done, what I've produced for people to improve their lives, and what he's done. What I will do as your president if given the chance to serve, and what he will do. Think about every single concern you've got. Think about your kids and your grandkids and what you'll tell them about how you voted, because I want you to join me in voting for a better America. And here in Iowa, it's really easy. You can vote today or tomorrow at the auditor's office or next week at libraries in Cedar Rapids and Marion. You can get a flyer as you leave from our organizers telling you the details. You can go to IWillVote.com to confirm your polling place to make sure you have a plan to vote. 
You can reach out to people who are maybe shut-ins or have trouble getting around and help them to be able to vote. Every phone call you make, every door you knock on will help us make a difference in this election. So please go to HillaryClinton.com and sign up to volunteer or take your phone out and text JOIN, J-O-I-N, to 47246. Because here's one thing you know for sure. On January 20th, America will have a new president. And the real question is, what kind of change are we going to have? Change is inevitable. It's up to us to determine how we're going to guide and shape that change. I personally don't think people, when they stop to consider it, want the kind of change Donald Trump is offering. Going back to the days when insurance companies and Wall Street could write their own rules, which is what he says he wants to do, rolling back marriage equality and women's rights, abandoning our alliances and allowing more countries to get nuclear weapons. Now that's change all right, but not the change we need. I have a very different vision. It's more positive, it's more unifying. I want us to be a country with good high paying jobs in every community, where college is affordable, where hardworking immigrants who pay taxes have a path to citizenship. where we respect each other, men and women, immigrants, African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, everybody, that we recognize we are in this together, and where we lead with strength and intelligence in the world, working with our allies to fight and defeat terrorism and stop the spread of nuclear weapons. So change is coming. The choice is yours as to what kind of country we will have. I want you to join me to build a stronger and fairer America. And I have made absolutely clear, I will fight for you, I will work for you, I will make a difference, a positive difference with results for you. We will have a future we can be proud of, and we will prove once and for all that love trumps hate. Thank you.